the top story I had for the week is about something that we haven't talked uh, much about, and that is autonomous boats. So these autonomous vehicles, it looks like they're getting uh, everywhere. And so this just is shows their extension in uh, the naval area. And then the coronavirus story is, quote, the way it's playing out is unexpected. And, you know, what we're getting with COVID is not what we expected. And it's not what we had with any of these pandemics before. And, you know, it's still uh, because of that, even more than usual, we don't know what's going on. It keeps mutating. <laughs> yes. Except uh, now in technology, a, a brain computer startup that was not Elon Musk's Neuralink has got it, the FDA approval for testing and has implanted its first device into a human being way ahead of Neuralink, way ahead of Elon Musk. Then in uh, energy and the environment, uh, there is a positive report. This is not a laboratory test. This is a, a real production installation, and it's a solar powered tower that makes uh, kerosene jet fuel out of water, CO2, and sunlight. And as I say, this is not a lab experiment. Uh, this is a demonstration of a production system. And so uh, this is pretty hopeful for at least carbon neutral flying because it's still going to be a long time before they replace things like jet fuel to fuel jets. Then in uh, physics, oh, there's another environmental story I'm going to cover too, and that is in China, their solar installations uh, were more than double in the first half of this year from last year. So solar development is accelerating significantly in China. Then in uh, space and physics, uh, we've reported a lot on the web. Another thing's going on simultaneously is the next edition of the Large Hadron Collider is turning on at new energy levels. And, you know, when it was running last time, we uh, discovered the Higgs boson, which has a real heavy implications in physics. And now uh, they're have done some upgrades and they can make 20 times the collisions that they used to and they're seeing what you get at this energy level. They hope they get something because now they're still getting guys to spend billions of dollars on new machines at new energy levels and what if your new device doesn't find anything. It's hard to keep keeping the billions of dollars going for the next bigger one. Then in uh, biologies, uh, it turns out that bees are really intelligence and uh, they have 
figured out how to start to look at the intelligence of individual bees. And so the bee intelligence is not just hive intelligence, which is what I had thought. It turns out that uh, there are genius bees too. In uh, the human story is about duration, depression and serotonin. And, you know, for the last 30 years, uh, there's been an enormous business from the drug business with selling antidepressants based on the idea that uh, serotonin uh, shortages bring about depression. This is the first careful study of all of the different studies that have been done for the last 30 years. And this study says there's no evidence that uh, any of this has, does any good other than sell a lot of pills. Oops. And in fact, maybe there is some bad effects of this because now if I think it's some mental defect, then it's uncurable and I'm just going to be stuck with it. Unless I take the pill, of course. Anyway, so uh, it may be one of the fundamental areas of uh, psychological <laughs> medical advancement is all just marketing hooey. And that's what they're finding with the, the uh, serotonin intake inhibitors. Exactly. That we've used antidepressants for decades. Right, 30 and years. now it appears that may, may not be a solution. Well, uh, one of the their conclusions after looking at one kind of study said uh, basically that there's no evidence that these SSRIs are any better than placebos. <laughs> and placebos oh, are, placebos it turns out are cheaper and safer. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, and then the last story, the medical story, is there is the beginning of human clinical trials on a potential universal flu vaccine. And it's going on at the US uh, NIH Clinical Center. And as we talk about it later, uh, they did something interesting in this uh, vaccine candidate. And I bet they'll use it again in other places where they're looking for universal vaccines. Maybe it will give us an idea how to make a universal vaccine for COVID. So, okay. So now on with the show. The unsinkable potential of nautical boats. Let me show a, get a picture up here. Here we have uh, the Mayflower autonomous ship. And if you look at it, it really looks pretty cool. It doesn't have a lot of deck area for the people to walk around since there aren't any people. And this uh, Mayflower Autonomous ship recently uh, completed its first uh, transatlantic journey. Now, this it would not be notice, notable except that this small robotic boat is the largest to navigate across the Atlantic using artificial intelligence with no humans aboard. 
And so this trip is the latest evidence that the future of the high seas could be autonomous ships. And these self-steering ships are another thing they call them. Uh, they are slowly becoming a reality. In Norway, there's an autonom autonomous battery powered container vessel that is shuttling fertilizer between a factory and a local port. So here we have one that is in use. And I just realized that I thought I shared the picture and I didn't. Hey, there's there's the Mayflower autonomous ship. Doesn't that look cool? Hmm. And uh, in there's a commercial tanker, the Prism Courage, that traveled recently from Texas through the Panama Canal to South Korea, entirely guided by software. This software is from Hyundai. And they think this is an interesting enough operation that they've branched out from cars into shipbuilding and are developing autonomous ships. And then uh, human transportation happens too. There's a self-driving water taxi ferrying people across the Tennessee River in Knoxville, Tennessee. So uh, these are there in the world. And uh, the Hyundai navigation tech works using AI to determine the ship's routes and speeds. And it considers all kind of thing, winds and waves and neighboring vessels. And uh, the AI and the Prism Courage, the one that went uh, to Korea through the Panama Canal, they say the AI boosted their fuel efficiency by about 7%, which significantly lowers the cost of operation and incidentally puts less garbage into the air. Uh, right now, it looks like smaller boats like survey vessels and ferries uh, will be faster to implement than large container ships. And one of the reasons for this is the savings for large container ships might not be so big. They really have a pretty small crew, about 20 people typically. And so uh, the cost savings may not be there yet, even though still it's going to save them money on fuel. And uh, there are concerns that uh, autonomous software could make them vulnerable to cyber attacks, except non-autonomous shipping operations are already being attacked by hackers. So. We don't know if that'll be worse. There's also, of course, a very complicated question about international maritime law and how to deal with the liability issues. So uh, these autonomous boats, uh, if they're successful, uh, they will use a wide variety of sensors using cameras and radars and GPS. And uh, advocates, like with autonomous cars, say these ships are less susceptible to human errors. And ship and boat accidents are actually pretty common and uh, pretty expensive. And right now, Ships with autonomous capabilities are just a tiny fraction of the vessels in operation. But in the future, self-steering ships could make all many water-based activities more convenient. 
Certainly an example, the Mayflower Autonomous Ship is designed to study the ocean's health and it doesn't include a deck or bathroom or bunk or the space that's needed by people. The space is mainly occupied by technology and not having humans on board frees up space to use for the technology. And uh, it turns out also these unmanned vehicles are able to spend more time and longer time at sea because they don't have to worry about those fragile people so much. And they think autonomous ships could also make it more convenient to transport freight. And in Japan, there is a partnership going on uh, where companies demonstrated earlier this year that autonomous container ships could travel between ports in Japan. It turns out this is particularly important in the shipping industry in Japan because they need more and more workers and they have to confront an aging population where they don't have the workers. So the, in the case of Japan, uh, they are hoping that these autonomous ships are able to uh, keep the freight moving when there are not enough people to do it. So this is just another direction in which this AI-based technology is moving. And I thought you would all be interested in hearing about it. Well, and it makes so much sense because ships, if I recall, normally require somebody from the port to, to uh, embark on them to dock them. Yes. So it, it's just a, it's a natural, it's like autonomous trucks on highways. Right. It takes, it takes a uh, driver off the uh, uh, interstates in the U.S. to oh. deliver the uh, uh, containers to their destination. Oh. Yes. And, and you think... Anyway, you would think it's pretty natural because also the other thing about ships is they don't turn fast. You know, so as long as you're able to uh, sense what's going on around you, then it seems like it would be a natural kind of application. And it doesn't surprise me to hear that AI pilots can operate at higher efficiency than human pilots. You know, I, I wonder about uh, uh, about hacking those uh, systems uh -huh. because if you if you take a boat that that is full full of uh, whatever it is, it's usually an enormous value, and it will be kind of interesting, I would think, to uh, to hackers to uh, to steer this boat away from where it's supposed to go into uh -huh. a place. <laughs> They're also, uh, I read in the article that uh, they think that pirates might have trouble with these boats because, you know, they're used to taking over boats that are uh, run in conventional ways. And then unless you have a techie among the pirate crew, then now you got the boat and what are you going to do with it? Well, if there's another no money factor, involved. Another saving is you don't have to have lifeboats or preservers. Right. Life uh, preservers. And they can also make these things so they run underwater. So they're below the weather and the waves and uh -huh. uh, have a easier time of it. Oh, that's right. That's right. And, you know, not only do you not have the people, you don't have to have food for people and uh, food preparation areas and all that stuff. So you save uh, all of the stuff required for the people. You don't even have to have toilets. 
I'd never read about this, Richard. That's it's a very interesting approach and obviously valid. Uh huh. Well, the future is coming from all directions at once. That's why we do these shows, and there's new stuff every week. Okay. Now, next is uh, the COVID story, and I'm afraid uh, the way that it's playing out is unexpected. And this story is about the UK, but it's applicable everywhere. You know, populations in the UK are again being cooped up in their bedrooms, having uh, nursing a fever and a sore throat in July as COVID infections uh, soar for the third major wave of the year. You know, we feel that some in Chapala, since my wife and I and a friend spent the last two weeks infected with this wave of COVID going by after avoiding it for two years. And for most like us, this will be an unpleasant inconvenience rather than a tragedy. But now, you know, there's a fourth wave expected this autumn and a fifth, maybe around Christmas time. And experts are saying that COVID may never settle into a seasonal cycle like flu did. And uh, there was an uh, influential article written in uh, 2020 uh, that was predicting that COVID was going to have uh, seasonal resurgences like the flu does. And so the expectations of the medical people around the world was for COVID to act like flu. But now the guy who wrote the study two years ago, his view has changed. And he says, we're in a different landscape. We're having such a rapid succession of variants is what we're seeing now. He said, I would have thought we would have reached a steady state by now, but it uh, doesn't look like this is the case. Successive waves are getting closer together and uh, becoming more frequent. And, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, new waves came where the next variant was more transmissible, like the Alpha and the Delta. Remember those old days of the Alpha and Delta COVID? But now the variants we have, uh, the new ones are being driven mainly by immune escape, the ability to infect people who have been vaccinated and infected even recently. In Australia, their health protection services now are saying uh, that within, if you have an infection of BA4 or BA5, you could get it again in 28 days after you got the previous infection. So they're saying this thing just can keep coming and keep coming. And each wave no longer brings the high death toll, but it's still felt across the country. And uh, particularly in healthcare, the healthcare system because of this remains under a lot of stress. And from a healthcare perspective, the pandemic is not over. Now, the problem is there's not a single simple solution. Vaccines have been uh, an overwhelming triumph, actually, and provide crucial protection against severe illness and death, but not against infection. 
And maybe this situation will improve as the next generation of vaccines become available. They're looking for variant-proof vaccines or pan-corona vaccines, like the pan-flu vaccine we'll hear about. There also continue to be efforts to develop a nasal vaccine that they think will provide uh, additional protections. And some places like Germany is investing in improved ventilation systems in schools and public buildings. But overall around the world, there appears to be little enthusiasm for more active management of COVID. And you know, if we let nature follow its course, we'll reach some sort of equilibrium, they suppose, but it may mean coexisting at a lower level of overall health. So that's Novak. the- Novak that's, has received approval for a protein-based uh, yes. COVID. Yes, and that uh, uh, is effective against the variants. Uh huh. That's good. Uh, in the U.S., it's only the the uh, application of that new antiviral is limited uh, to people who have not yet been vaccinated, rather uh -huh. than those of us who wish a booster to avoid infection from the variants, but it is effective against the variants. That's, that's good news. Now, when, when do we get it in Mexico? What does quien sabe mean? <laughs> okay, so to get it in Mexico, we have to drive to the US, you're saying. But even in the U.S., we're not eligible if we've already been vaccinated. Oh, shit. Uh, it is just available to those who have not been vaccinated. Okay. 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 Well, I, uh, we're still looking for a comprehensive solution. Well, it's interesting, but uh, maybe COVID is one of those environmental events that causes evolution. And it may be that uh, by uh, fighting it off, we've allowed it to repeatedly mutate. And every time it mutates, we could have a, a greater or lesser virulence in the mutation. Right, right. And it may have been better had we just let it run its course and uh, peter out and that'd be it. Now there's a new COVID every year, apparently. I mean, they're always coming well, we've along, had so. Presently, we ha are having like four or five new COVIDs every year. Yeah. The other thing that's half interesting is we talk about the number of deaths due to COVID, but I don't think they're counting the number of deaths due to delayed health care. Right. And... Uh, impacts on the healthcare system that is overloaded with COVID detention. Yeah, there so, are alternate measurements, which are excess death measurements, which is still hard to compute, but it includes then just everybody who's dying. So yeah. you can't get the other ones. There, there is a, a lot of complaint about the uh, delayed uh, other, uh, you know, kind of um, discretionary operations or things like knee replacements and hip replacements and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Yes, yes. But, right, because the hospitals, many of them are still overloaded and still having trouble catching up on their schedule. And the hospitals, of course, as each wave goes through, has times for their real short of personnel because uh, their doctors and nurses have it. And, and because yeah. we're overloading the healthcare system, we're burning out those people right. and they're taking early retirement or moving uh -huh. into other careers. That's right, burning out our best people. 
Yep. Oops, not a good solution. Okay. But on the science and uh, Richard, uh, subsequently you have a uh, note on a universal flu vaccine. Yes, yes. That uh, attacks the, the variants because right now flu vaccines are engineered for specific strains every right. year. Right. And uh, I'll talk about that and their approach, I think, was real interesting and was not an approach that I've seen elsewhere in the vaccines. So next up, uh, we have, uh, our, I guess it's our Elon Musk story for the week. He's in the news so much now. Uh, and I would say not all of the reports in the news are uh, favorable to him. This particular one, there's a company, Synchron. Has anybody heard of Synchron? No. no. Uh, anyway, they keep beating Neuralink. Lots of people have heard of Neuralink, right? And uh, to the punch in their brain computer interface work and what they did recently is they have implanted the first device in a u.s patient um, and that puts them uh at their score is one versus Neuralink's zero implants in human patients and uh it's a uh, ALS patient in Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. And the purpose of this device is to allow the patient to communicate even after they've lost the ability to move by using thoughts to send emails and tests. In Australia, they've already implanted this device in four patients who have been able to use their brain implants to send messages and get on WhatsApp and shop online. Okay, they can use their brain computer interface to go on Amazon and order something online. And, uh, Last year, this Australia-based company received permission from the US FDA to begin human tests. Again, Neuralink doesn't have that kind of permission yet. And so now this year, they're going ahead in uh, doing it. Now, there are some differences in uh, the implants and the products and how they are implanted. Uh, the Synchron's product is implanted in two operations with, you know, one of these tubes sending something uh, through the system and into the brain, the, kind of the same way that they install stents in cardiac operations. Uh, Neuralink's uh, device is smaller and of course Musk would say very much better but it presently requires uh, an operation by a robot to drill holes in your head and stick it in through your skull maybe that's the reason why the FDA is not so hot on approving it because it's a much more severe procedure and also it turns out synchron's uh ambitions are to make something where that will benefit these patients who are paralyzed patients and elon musk uh being elon musk has grand ideas about this and his ideas are to make a device that will let us 
be able to telepathically communicate with each other so we won't need to use zoom anymore and then also so we can communicate directly to our ai systems so musk has uh big ideas it turns out uh you know, Musk is still having a little trouble with his organization. Earlier this year, uh, the president of Neuralink and one of its founders, Max Hodak, resigned and then told people that he'd invested in Synchron stock after the resignation. So Musk's main technical officer has resigned Neuralink and invested in its competitor. So I'm not sure if uh, that's much of a sign of confidence in the Neuralink effort. Anyway, the brain transplants and implants are going on and we'll still have to wait a while before we're able to watch our latest movie on Netflix with our brain computer interface. It's, it's an interesting uh, angle because uh, they worked really hard to convert robots into humans. This is coming from the <laughs> other end. We're taking humans and converting them into robots. That's right. And Musk's approach to AI is to centralize it rather than have it uh, uh, in individual units, to have it in central locations. Uh -huh. And that's what he's been working on with fu full self-drive, which is a much lesser issue. Uh -huh. So that certainly has been, you know, if you look in the computer generations, this moving it uh, centrally versus distributing, it out to the edges has been uh, one of the dynamics really of the last 50 years. And as the power of the different pieces change, what is the best solution changes. But the communication that, that uh, Musk has done with Starlink, like the 10,000 terminals uh -huh. in between the Starlink terminals, uh, does make the possibility of centralized AI even more likely. Uh-huh. Well, certainly if you have centralized AI and you're using it for real-time control, you have to have a system with no latency. Starlink has, has very infinitesimally small latency uh -huh. because the satellites are so low in Earth orbit. Uh -huh. the, other, the other thing the centralized uh, control does is it enables them to centralize control of everything and everyone and the economy. And uh, so That's it's right. more, da more dangerous than useful. Yes. I'm sorry. I guess my eyes are just supposed to glow when you say centralized control. Ooh. I see that one of the uh, one of the byproducts is that a paralyzed person will be able to shop online. Yes, yes. So, I've read reports already of paralyzed people who are able to have a conversation with their child, for wow. example. And, you know, the stories that they are releasing are uh, very heart touching. Of course, they don't release the story of the person who just died in pain. Right. Locked off to the world. I wonder if it's an ulterior motive, though, to get people to shop shop online. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I, you think Amazon is behind <laughs> it. I would believe it, you know. Bezos is maybe more dangerous than Musk because he's not a publicity hound. He's just taken over. Still, it takes, it's an invasive procedure. Yes. And I, I think that uh, most people, you know, are not 
going to be very ready and uh, panting at uh, you know to, to to get injected with a <laughs> the robot. But you know, I'm a science fiction reader, and I've been reading for more than fifty years stories that had uh, the guy jacking in, you know, connecting himself up to this external network. Uh, usually, the stories they were doing it for amusement rather than to take over the world, but. Well, and uh, initially this may come as an optional thing that you can accept, but uh, eventually it could be a compulsory thing, like uh, you're not allowed to drive without uh, vehicle insurance and right, right. that sort of thing. Well, it's so hard. You... Yes. This is another thing that we will just have to see how it works out but the pieces for doing it, they are making and testing and installing in real human beings now. And all of those are, you know, kind of critical stages of the development of the technology. So it's getting developed and installed. It's a scary, scary idea, and really. And again, as the technologists will say, is we'll see later how it works out for the society, you know, but first let us make a bunch of money. You know, you can control the behavior of, of humans on uh, a large scale. Well, uh, good luck on that. I can just see, you know, you want to make war and so uh, people uh, uh, you don't need to recruit so just put out this command and everybody <laughs> comes and go and get their guns and things like that and start killing each other okay so now let us go from uh ai technology to uh solar energy technology and this particular one, I think, is uh, cute uh, and very interesting. And researchers have designed and to put in place a system that uses water, CO2, and sunlight to produce aviation fuel. Uh, let me show you a uh, picture of what we have. Oops. So here we have a big field with reflective mirrors around it that are focused on a tower at the top. And all of this sunlight heats this. Uh, Your screen share didn't come through. Ah, uh, OK. Well, my operate my screen share has an operator problem again, just like it did last <laughs> time. Okay, yeah. here we are. Okay. Oh, okay, let me get one other picture. There is the installation, and they have almost two hundred reflectors that are reflecting uh, sunlight into this tower. And at the top of the tower, uh, they're using that heat from the sunlight is the only energy source. Then they're using a very inexpensive catalyst, which is reusable as catalysts are, and uh, uh, making uh, water and CO2 into a uh, fuel that can power jets, you know, so jet airplane fuel. The aviation sector is responsible for about 5% of uh, anthropomorphic uh, emissions that affect climate change. And really now 
there is no clean alternative to the power uh, that is used to fly the long-term commercial flat, flights. You know, the basic fuel they use is, you know, on one hand, they call it uh, jet fuel. On another hand, they call it kerosene. And so they're able to use this reaction and uh, produce uh, kerosene from the CO2 in the air. And the kerosene that they produce, the solar made kerosene, is fully compatible with the existing aviation fuel infrastructure. So it's easy to start to use. And uh, the uh, heat energy converts water and CO2 into syn gas, and the synthetic gas is then sent to a gas to liquid converter where it's converted into uh, kerosene, and it can be made into diesel as well. And this whole setup was done uh, demonstrating how you would set it up for an industrial application. So this is not a lab test proving some concept. This is a commercial test proving uh, the implementation of the concept. Right now, the efficiency of the process, the portion of the solar energy converted into fuel was around 4% through various things they're working on. They think they can quadruple this. And so here we have a uh, working uh, sunlight and CO2 to jet fuel production. Yeah, the one thing they don't say is how diffuse the energy from the sunlight is and how concentrated the energy is in the kerosene that they make. And what uh, it uh, really requires is about a, uh, 640 acres of uh, uh, mirrors to produce a barrel of uh, kerosene. So, uh, they need to uh, tell us how many, uh, um, what fraction of the U.S. would have to be uh, converted into this to replace the jet fuel they currently use, and it would be alarming how much space it would take. Anyway, I'm not sure if you're right on the space requirements here, and I'm not sure what the output of the thing was. They did have 169 mirrors. I think it was, uh, you know, not an enormous area. It didn't look like it from the photo, but there's no humans in the photo for scale. What? Yeah, and they don't tell you how much kerosene they're able right. to make right. today. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. stuff they don't. Anyway, they're working on the yield, but the thing is that this is not a laboratory demonstration. This is uh, a, a production demonstration. It's still early in the technology, but it's still a production demonstration. So it moves it further than other uh, sunlight and CO2 things that we've talked about over the last couple of years. Yeah, it's definitely further than a lab uh, scale test. Yes, yes. Yeah. I also wondered about the stability of the product, if that'd be the same as uh, kerosene made from, uh, from oil. Yeah, it's the same. It can be uh, used in the same infrastructure. It can be mixed together. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. But I mean, uh, if it stay, if it sits in a tank, or, or, or you know, it uh, in transportation from one place to the next, where it's going to be used, is this product stable, or is yes, it yes, it's apart? just it's just like kerosene. It's no different chemically than kerosene. Oh, okay, yeah. It, it would probably be better than the stuff from a refinery because it was more processed. Right, fewer impurities. I believe you're right, yeah. Andrew.
you know, it, it seems to me that it's just uh, a delay in getting rid of the under combustion engine, which, uh, which in the future, I think we will have to get rid of the inner combustion engine. So. Right, and right now the other, you know, the question is for long range flight, what do you do? And the best alternative they have now is uh, hydrogen and even liquid hydrogen does not have the same energy content per weight as does kerosene. Sounds like the next step is still uh, batteries, solar to batteries. Well, for airplane, the batteries, it looks like the batteries will work on short to mid range flights. It doesn't cover the long range flights. So that's really the sticking point presently. No, the, the longer range flights, uh, Rolls-Royce has introduced a turbo generator so that the electric aircraft mm -hmm. are hybrids, which makes a lot more sense because the density <laughs> storage is much, much greater in, in hydrogen and in uh, kerosene, whatever, than it is in batteries. So hybrid electric aircraft are going to uh, come to us first. Mm -hmm. Well, there will be short range pure electrics and maybe mid range pure electrics, but, and there are both of those that are, you know, in test and kind of early deployment presently. What I thought was cute was that uh, hybrid electric blimp that we saw uh, two or three weeks ago, which is, uh, though it's slow, it's a lot more efficient in terms of passenger mile per uh, pound of fuel. So anyway, we'll see. And for the environmental story, then I think uh, this is hopeful and it's coming from the presently the biggest polluter in the, on the planet, China. And uh, China in the first half of this year built 31 gigawatts of new solar power up 130% from the first half of last year. And so uh, China now has a little bit more than 25% of uh, their solar power or their power come from solar power now. And uh, China is still planning. And in cases like this, we can see the action acting to basically double the amount of power uh, that they get from renewables by 2030. On another positive sign, the China's sale of uh, equipment for solar power, because they're still the biggest manufacturer of that in the world, is also surging which and it's more than doubled from this time last year. So uh, China is seeing a lot of signs of the solar implementation, both in what they're doing in their own country and in their sales of equipment. And, and they're doing that to replace uh, fossil fuel generated in energy. Right, they're having their, China is having trouble with their energy level and they're still making new uh, fossil fuel plants, not as fast as they used to be, but they're still increasing their use of coal. But eventually, eventually that's the idea to, to replace 
not, not entirely. When you say that they have 25% of their electrical uh, generation as uh, renewable or solar, it, it still only generates about a third of that or 8% as the of the actual generation because of the solar not being available at night and that sort of thing uh -huh. but yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's still in the right direction but uh, as john points out they're not actually replacing coal-fired power they're still in ever increasing power demands and in um i got some numbers in 2021 they installed 90 gigawatts of new coal-fired power against this 34 gigawatts of solar power that they in have half a year, right? In half That's a year. That's about so, what they say that that is what they think they will add in renewables. And it's renewables. It's not just solar that they're talking about. I think. Yeah. But anyway, you're, you're certainly right. But without the adding this renewable instead of adding uh, the 90, whatever the units of measure was to meet their current requirement, they would have had to add 180. Whatever. And yep. the other thing is India and Japan are still building new coal-fired plants. Right. And you have to wonder if uh, solar is so great, why is Japan building coal-fired plants they, they don't have any local coal. They have to import all the coal they fire in these things, but they're still building coal-fired power plants. Or maybe Japan has a problem with land space. Part of the problem with solar is you got to have to put it on land, and Japan, as an island state, doesn't have as much land as they have in Texas. That's true. Only about 10% of Japan's land area is actually occupied because so much of it is mountainous. Right. Okay. So from the solar power to the large hadron collider. Now, you know, we, uh, we've talked a lot about the web as one of the big developments of this year in the scientific community. The other big development is uh, they have powered up the Large Hadron Collider uh, for the first time in several years. The last time it was powered up, it found the Higgs boson, which... Uh, is a key element in the standard theory of uh, how the universe is made up. And they've invested a ton of money. And here, let's look at what we have. Here is this thing. Here's the large Hadron converter. Uh, this is uh, now it uh, sends two beams of proteins in oper opposite directions, nearly the speed of light around an 17 mile ring that is buried 100 meters deep on the Swiss French border. So this is a circle. Uh, with a circumference of 11 miles. And here is more of the large Hadron converter. It seems like I would sure like to have the uh, concession for selling them wire because it looks like they use more wire than anything else I've ever seen. And to give you a sense of scale, here is a guy on his bicycle cruising from one place in the converter to another. And what I can see is that I didn't share these again. What a crappy operator I am today. So here's the LHC going around 
It's a 17 mile circumference and an example of all of the wiring that it uses and the guy riding around in a bicycle. So this is a pretty big piece of scientific equipment. And I'm not sure what the costs were. It was multiple billions of dollars that came from uh, different com countries in Europe. I think the US has some funding too, but I'm not sure. And, you know, one of the things they want to be able to answer at this energy level, uh, this energy level is about 30 times higher than it was the last time it was turned on, is, is the Higgs boson really a fundamental particle or is it just a composite of other particles? And then what else is there of these big particles at these high energy levels, what else is there? And uh, so they, what they did so far the last time around is again, they confirmed uh, elements of the standard model. They developed some new questions though that makes them wonder about the standard model and Maybe they'll find out that the standard model isn't uh, correct. And it's got several experiments. So it's got, I think, 19 different experiments on it. One of which is the ALICE, which uh, probes the matter that existed uh, in the first 10 milliseconds after the Big Bang. So that's kind of an interesting experiment. What was going on in the early microseconds of the universe? And then there is another one using collisions to simulate cosmic rays. And so they're going to have some months of operation at this energy level. And then they're going to shut it down again until 2029. And it's going to come back online is the high luminosity LHC, which uh, increases the number of detectable events by a factor of 10. So they're trying to continue to turn up the power and see what they find. And I know that the, the scientists want to find something because if they don't find something new, it's hard to keep the uh, investments of billions of dollars for the next model coming from the community. So that's an example of big science. I don't know about anybody else, but I remember about 20 years ago when they first started one of these big deals, uh, that there was some, some concern that it might change the fabric of, of existence. Yes, that's right, and destroy the universe. That's right. Yes. Oops. And I'm wondering, <laughs> and now they're going to do this one, and then in... I don't know, another 10 years, they're going to do an even bigger one. I wonder if that's uh, of concern to anybody, except maybe I've read too many science fiction books also. Yeah, I, I haven't uh, read any of those concerns in the stuff I've been exposed to. They've been mainly talking about the wonder of it. Uh, what I still, with all of this stuff, I remember Richard Feynman talking about this part of physics. And he said, you know, it's like uh, you have a gold watch and you want to know what the gold watch is made of. So you hit it with a hammer and all kind of stuff comes out. And then you that made you really curious. So then you take the gold watch and you get even a bigger hammer. And even more stuff comes out. And it's kind of like that's what we're seeing. Anyway, anyway. I just like the story. Yep.
A little scary though. Yeah. It may yep. set up a chain reaction is what you're saying. Right. right. To set up a chain reaction to destroy the planet and maybe the universe. I think I that the only one that's really worried about that is Al Gore, but he hasn't figured out how to improve his own self-interest by pursuing it. So that's why we haven't heard much. Okay. Well, Al Gore, you need to be more selfish. Yeah. Okay. That'll fit in American politics just right. Okay. Now, the next story we have is the biology story. And this story is about the bee's knees. And it turns out bees are really highly intelligent. And you might be surprised to discover just how much bees know. There is now uh, evidence that there is some kind of conscious awareness in bees, that is that bees are sentient and they have, they don't know if they have emotions, but they think they have emotion-like states, which maybe are emotions, they don't know. Uh, there's a new book, The Mind of the Bee, that was published a few weeks ago. And it argues that bees need our protection not just because they're useful, but because bees are sentient beings like us and humans have an ethical obligation to ensure their survival. Uh, his work, he says, has shown that bees are really highly intelligent individuals. They can count, recognize images of human faces, learn simple tool use, and learn abstract concepts. He thinks bees have emotions and can plan and imagine things and can recognize themselves as unique entities apart from the other bees. That's pretty highly developed sentience in my opinion. And uh, to, he's done many experiments in his labs on female worker bees. And typically in the experiment, when a bee does something right, they'll get a sugar reward. That's how they train them. And in one experiment, beans are shown several different uh, monochrome images of human faces and ended up learning that one is associated with a sugar reward. It takes them only a dozen or two dozen training sessions with that kind of reward to learn to uh, recognize the face that's going to give them the reward. Uh, the bees also seem to be capable of imagining how things will look or feel. For example, they could identify a spear visually, which previously they had only felt in the dark. So they can translate the feeling in the dark to what they're able to see and then recognize the object. They also, uh, he says they could understand abstract concepts like the same or different. And one of the things he found that I think is really interesting is some bees are more curious and confident than others. So he was able to find basically genius bees that can do something better than all the other individuals in the colony. And he learned that bees learn best by watching other bees. And because of this, once you train a single individual in the colony, the skill spreads swiftly 
to everyone else, all the other bees in the colony, so they learn from each other. Here he tried a trick in one experiment, though. He deliberately trained a demonstrator bee to carry out a task in a suboptimal way. And then there was an observer bee watching him. And the observer bee would not simply ape the demonstration and copy the action that she had seen, but would spontaneously improve her technique to solve the task more efficiently without any kind of trial and error. So they saw the bee learning something new from some other bee, but learning something that wasn't a good solution. And before the bee did it themselves, they must have thought about it and figured out, hey, that's not a good way to do it. And when they do it, they do it a new, more efficient way. Now, I wish that all the people I knew could do that. I was actually impressed by my four-year-old son because he would watch me doing things in the yard and then he would uh, replicate what that bee did. So I thought he was doing pretty well. So anyway, he thinks because of uh, this process, he thinks that bees do some, something that's like thought, some kind of internal modeling about what do I do to get the desired outcome. And that's a sophisticated inference, but I think a pretty relevant one. And uh, he himself, he says, is pretty convinced that bees are sentient beings. We're exposing them to challenges that no bee has ever encountered in its evolutionary history, and they're solving them. So bees look like they have something going for them. They may take over from octopuses as the uh, intelligent animal. That's right. right. They'll do better. Uh, above the water level than octopuses, I bet. Shakespeare already wrote about this, didn't he? To be or not to be? Yes. And I'm glad to hear it's not going to be the cockroaches that take over. They have taken over already. Ah, uh, oops, I forgot. <laughs> you know, I don't know about anybody else, but I saw confirmation bias just written all over this, but uh, not knowing any more than what I've just uh, read in the article. But here's a guy who for 30 years or more is his sole thing is studying bees uh -huh. and trying, trying, I think, to prove that they're more intelligent than a lot of other things. I don't know. <coughs> I would say the jury's out on that. I'm with the chat on that. Well, we'll, uh, we'll see. I certainly understand what you're saying about confir bi confirmation bias. But <coughs> another thing that could be possible is after 30 years of studying, he has insights that uh, we don't have. He wants to believe it. Well, maybe. Maybe he just believes it because it's what he saw. But maybe it's so, and if it is, I think that's great. And I don't kill a bee anyway. Okay, well, good. Good for you. Now, in, in India, where we were, there were Jains who are more extreme in their uh, harmlessness behavior than other uh, religious groups and the classic Jain would have a sweeper walking down the street in front of him sweeping off insects so he wouldn't step in one.
and the, and the Janes wear a face mask so they won't inhale a mosquito. Yes, yes. But there's also proof that wasps recognize one another's faces because every time a wasp encounters a stranger, they have to uh, fight it out to determine who's ah, subordinate okay. and who's superior. Okay. Okay. And so by uh, recognizing faces, they avoid the energy expended in uh, having these uh, contests uh -huh. with a stranger because they, and so they've shown that the wasps can remember a face for up to two years. Wow, I wish I could. <laughs> well, we're okay with faces. It's names we don't uh, connect to faces. <laughs> right. The, well, I keep exactly. saying I do better with numbers than I do with names. And if all of you guys just had numbers, I would remember them. Oh, well. Yeah. So the next story is a... Uh, brain story and it turns out uh they're the authors are saying depression is probably not caused by a chemical imbalance of the in the brain and this is a new study and it really is a study of studies in the past three decades people have been deluged with information suggesting that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain, namely imbalance with a brain chemical called serotonin. And this latest uh, research review shows that the evidence does not support this uh, claim. And the serotonin theory of depression started to be widely promoted by the pharmaceutical industry in the 1990s and uh through that uh and their efforts to market this new class of drugs many people around the world started to taking these antidepressants because they believed they had something wrong, a chemical imbalance in their brain that required this antidepressant to put right. And so the sale of these antidepressants climbed dramatically. But for a long time, some academics and researchers have suggested that there really is no satisfactory evidence to support the idea that depression is a result of abnormally low or uh, inactive serotonin. But until now, there's been no comprehensive review of the research done to be able to uh, form any conclusions either way. Uh, what these people have done is research the research and uh, have their uh, opinions based on that. And, you know, their part of the issues is that drug trials show that antidepressants are barely distinguishable from a placebo when it turns to treating depression. And, uh, also, it turns out that antidepressants do have some generalized emotional numbing effect, which may affect people's moods, which may affect the depression. But this part of it really has not been studied. Uh, there has been a lot of research on the serotonin since the 1990s. But again, we haven't collected or analyzed it systematically before. One area of research was research comparing levels of serotonin and its breakdown products in the blood or brain fluid. And overall, this research does not show a difference between people with depression 
and those without depression. So they can't find a difference in serotonin and serotonin breakdown products in the brain between depressed people and undepressed people. Uh, there was also research done on serotonin receptors and the research on the most uh, commonly investigated receptor suggested either no difference with people with depression and without depression or that the serotonin activity was actually increased with people with depression, the opposite of the theory. There's also research on serotonin transponders that suggested, if anything, there was increased serotonin activity in the brains of people with depression. So uh, they also looked at research that explored whether depression can be induced in volunteers by artificially lowering their level of serotonin. And this research found out that lowering serotonin did not produce depression in hundreds of healthy volunteers. So uh, they're not sure what's going on with depression. These guys are pretty sure that uh, the SSRIs as a treatment for depression either has no effects or might be dangerous. So they conclude that based on these studies, it's impossible to say whether taking SSRI antidepressants is worthwhile or even safe. So this may be another story where we have been sold a bill of goods by Big Pharma. Well, you know, I, I, I spent... I've always wondered why I continued to be in depression. Well, I was spent five years in um, Indonesia and I studied depression in expatriate wives. And uh, the ones that were uh, involved with the school and their children were never depressed. The ones that volunteered and were active in helping the community and whatever were never depressed. And the ones who were depressed were the ones who were not doing anything and were not valued by their families or by the mm -hmm. community. So the cure to depression is to be valued by your community and family. And the key to that is to become useful. And so my advice to all these depressed expat wives was to make themselves more useful. It wasn't always welcome, the advice, but... Uh, but it's uh -huh. a good it's good advice and like Richard in your own case you would never be depressed because you're useful to this community of interested people. Right, right, and that's one of and the I, reasons I, why I, I am. Jakarta International School, both campuses, and what delightful campuses! What great education that they provided. Where was this, Norman? In Jakarta. Oh, yeah, okay. That's where I was, yeah. Well, I think this could have been your top story, Richard. Uh, the, the effect, if, if this is true, and if it gets incorporated into the mindset of the medical community, this could be uh, make a big change in how depression is treated. Uh, yes. In that article, it said that one in six adults in the UK were take, were on antidepressants. Yes. yes. So this is, you know, this is a big deal. Uh, yes. But part of it is the decline in local volunteerism and local clubs and associations because increased socialized governments have taken responsibility away from local communities for looking after themselves and uh, the, the people in their communities. So local, people no longer have that 
self-reliance. They're not, they don't have that usefulness that they had 50 years ago. So when they don't feel useful, they're not valued. When they're not valued, they're depressed. And but could big, that apply to any of us, Andrew? Yeah, big pharma <laughs> can't make any money on it. So it's not uh, promoted. And we can yeah. blame Al Gore for that, right? You could. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But the, one, of the th one of the things that I try to encourage people is to do something. Well, to volunteer, to help other it people. Doesn't, uh, well, yeah. there are a lot of ways to be able to do something. What I've found yeah. is doing something to help other people is one big way. There are also other people who have creative energy that's bottled up and just uh get over your fear of doing something and do it and you're a lot better doing it than you are not doing it yeah i, well, I, I met found, i have found that helping women beneficially to myself <laughs> was a good program that's right that's right well, and I found a, a woman on the street, and I thought she was a street person, but she was a retired geophysicist. And what she did was uh, picked up garbage on the street, picked up litter on the street and put it in waste bins. And that's how she's uh, amused herself on her morning walks. Right. But uh, everyone in the neighborhood knew who she was, and uh, she felt useful, and they appreciated what she did. Mm -hmm. At the UUs, I gave a couple of talks about uh, what the Hindus view as karma yoga, which is uh, doing the heart of it is doing selfless service for other people. And my own experience in doing things like that is it's been one of the things that feeds me energy and makes me happy. That's interesting. I, uh, I'm a member of another group, and uh, one subject that we had we took up was happiness. And there's a, there is a scientific study that uh, tried to determine, you know, how people could be happy. And a lot of people, you know, don't think that you can use science in this kind of uh -huh. touchy feely area but but you can design a, <clears throat> a research I'm sure, project i'm sure you can and what they found uh, the main thing that they found is how you how you make yourself happy is to make other people happy yes so that's again what i found and what uh andrew is talking about as well so it's studies easy. have shown studies well, I, have shown that studies have shown that people who give more rather than spending on themselves are happier. Right. Well, one right. of the other things that I say about happiness is if you want happiness in your life, then give it away. Now, my psychiatrist in Las Vegas, when I wasn't starving to death anymore, said, Norman, you'd been sold a bill of goods. Having money is not going to make you happy. Right. What you need is a dirty, filthy ashram. OK. There we are. Now we've not only solved the problems of the world, but of happiness. Uh, I love it. You know, I feel like my job at this time in life is to be happy every day. You know, it's what, the, what other could there be? That's but, right. It's the best uh, job I've I, had. I was, I was visiting with somebody the other day <laughs> that, that enjoyment is not happiness right. right happiness is a different issue i right. don't know who that was
Okay, so now the last story is a trial of a potential flu vaccine at the NIH, a universal flu vaccine. And it's a, a phase one clinical trial of a new vaccine. It's a placebo control uh, trial. The vaccine name is BPL 1357. And uh, this was developed by researchers at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And uh, the preliminary testing has shown that uh, the BPL 1357 uh, performed very well in the preclinical studies. So they're really looking forward to how it performed with people. And what's different about this vaccine is this is a whole virus vaccine that's made of four different types of uh, flu vaccine, flu virus that has made, been made non-infectious and chemically inactivated. And uh, so it is uh, from Avon flu viruses. So it's four different flu viruses combined into one strain and then used as a virus. And in animal studies, they found that all mice that received two doses of this vaccine uh, later survived exposure to what otherwise would be lethal, lethal doses of six different viruses, including different viruses that were not within the four that they used to build up the virus. So they are really very encouraged that this is going to be an effective uh, multi-species uh, flu virus. And if they're able to do this influenza vaccine that can provide long lasting protection against a wide range of seasonal influenza viruses, uh, then it limits the pandemic uh, potential in flu. And it also would be an important uh, public health tool. So here we are with uh, phase one clinical human testing going on on a uh, universal flu vaccine. And I think that's uh, positive and that would be good for all of us. I would take it. How about you? Why not? <laughs> I see the study is uh, going on right now, and it might be done in seven months, probably early right. spring. Right. So, so that's encouraging. It's not just something that's going to happen. Right. And this is a this is Dr. Fauci. Uh huh. Not that we can give him full credit for it, but uh, well, if he contributed to it at all, then it's a real service. Yeah, he's the head of the agency. Okay. And, and he was quoted in the article. Okay. I didn't notice that. So you no. paid better attention than I did. Thank you. And again, what I wonder is here, the particular technique they use is they use four different strains of the virus put them together, you know, weak them, weakened them so that they would not be infectious and put them together. And so the using of these four different strains of the flu virus then uh, looks like it may make a positive uh, 
virus that is effective against many different kinds. And so I wonder, gee, what can they do with coronavirus? You know, following the same idea. Well, it's the same thing as, as uh, HIV. Now we're approaching a universal HIV. Yes. Vaccine. Yes. And remember the devastation that HIV caused in the yes. U.S. Yes, I and do. The government just ignored it. Right. You know, certainly in San Jose, I lived at least on the edge of uh, one of the local LBTQ communities, and uh, I saw the impact of HIV had on uh, this community of people that I knew. And to say devastating kind of is understatement, especially in the early days. Well, it seems that new viruses are springing up all the time. You got a solution for one, and then out of left left corner, another virus comes along. Uh -huh. I, I, I wonder. I, I wonder. Yeah. All of this stuff that I'm hearing makes me wonder again about the polio virus, because uh, uh, that one does not seem to be mutating or something like these other ones we've been able to control it somehow with vaccines and i wonder what the difference is yeah good question <laughs> was polio a vax a vac a virus or was it a bacteria or oh the polio it? virus again uh, okay i don't remember having to develop a new polio virus every three months a uh, vaccine every three months oh well, polio is polio and no it does not have mutation it's not as uh, mutagenic or something anyway it's just another thing, another area where I know what nothing about. Mutagenics mean? Mutagenic. Mutagenic means it mutants. Mutants everywhere. <laughs> like the sci fi stories, Chad. Okay. Well, thank you, folks. And we'll do it again next week. Adiós.